Now, the first verse reads like this. And you'll notice I make a slight change, which I find in the New Schofield Bible, and I feel like they've made a change for the better. I'm reading verse 1, chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past under the fathers by the prophets. Now, there's several things that we must say about that verse there. It begins, as you note, with God, God. And this epistle here has a certain thesis on which it rests. As you know, when you study geometry, there are certain axioms that you begin with. If you didn't begin with them, you wouldn't begin. If 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 4, then we're at C as far as mathematics is concerned. And a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Now, they can prove that. That is sure. But you accept that. And when you do, then you move on and you can prove something else. Now, the Word of God in this epistle here, just as the book of Genesis, makes no effort to prove the existence of God. And if you do not believe in God, may I say this to you very candidly and very kindly, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. I didn't say that. God said that. And that word fool actually means insane. There are many forms of insanity. One form of insanity is to deny the existence of God. And we got a lot of nuts walking around today, by the way. Or as one young person said to me, speaking of a person that seemed to be off his rocker, why, he said to me, says, Dr. McGee, you know he's not dealing with a full deck. Well, there are a lot of folk that are not dealing with a full deck today because of the fact that they do not believe in God. You will find in this epistle that when you get to the 11th chapter, which is called the faith chapter, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that seek after him. Now, that is an assumption, let us say, of this epistle. It's the assumption of the book of Genesis. It's the assumption of the Word of God. The Bible makes no effort to try to prove the existence of God. And we have today, actually, courses in seminaries that spend a lot of time. I've been through those courses, and I know what I'm talking about when I say it's a great waste of time to try to build up some philosophic system that you can prove the existence of God. There's something wrong with you. If you can't walk out and look up at the mountains or walk down to the seashore and look at the sea or look into the heavens that declare the glory of God. And if they are not saying something to you about a creator, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, my friend, you're not dealing with a full deck. There's something radically wrong with your thinking. And then the second assumption that we have here is that God has spoken. Now, very frankly, if we did not have a revelation from God and we were without it, I believe that realizing that God is an intelligent person and that he's given to mankind a certain degree of intelligence, that God would speak to us. And if we didn't have a revelation, I would suggest we just wait around and he would speak to us, that the Creator would get a message through to us. He's an intelligence, and he's given to us a certain amount of intelligence, and he can communicate, and he has communicated with us. Now, also, that revelation that we have from God is the inspired Word of God. That is the other thing that you assume that these scriptures that we have are divinely inspired. Now, I think that God, therefore, has spoken to us here. Now, 
he deals with that revelation. And the revelation that he's talking about here, of course, is the Old Testament and the Old Testament as we have it today. Now, will you notice what he says and how he says it here? God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, there are those today that feel like Paul did not write the epistle to the Hebrews, and one of the arguments is because that actually the epistle to the Hebrews is magnificent Greek. It's smooth. It was written by one who was a master of the Greek language, and there is a beauty in it that you miss in our translation, by the way. And you find that right here at the beginning. There's a play upon two words. He says sundry times here, at sundry times. And the word in the Greek is polymeros. And divers manners are diverse manners, polytropos. Notice the beauty of that. It's almost poetic. It sounds like Homer. Polymeros, polytropos. There's a beauty here. But there's more than just a beauty. There is a tremendous statement that is made here. Now, when he says sundry times, actually, this is not a time word as we think of it, that God spoke the day and he spoke yesterday and he spoke the day before. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis is this, that God spoke through Moses. But before that, God spoke to Abraham. Now, he spoke to Abraham apparently by dreams and by sending the angel of the Lord to him. Now, when he spoke to Abraham, he didn't tell him what he told Moses. You see, he didn't say anything at all to Abraham about the law. He didn't give him any Ten Commandments. But he gave the Ten Commandments later on to Moses. And then later on, he told David that there's coming in his line a king, and that king would be a savior. In fact, David, when he was an old man, said, this is my salvation. <laughs> there's one coming that'll be my savior. Now, he didn't give that to Moses, and he didn't give it to Abraham. In fact, he gave Moses a law. They were not to have a king. They were to turn to God. But God knew the human heart, and in time they said they wanted to be like the other nations round about them. They asked for a king. And it's marvelous how God moves in at a time like that. He granted their request. He sent leanness to their souls. But God used that as the method of getting the Messiah, the Savior, into the world. So what he's saying here in this marvelous word is that God, as he went along, he didn't give it all to Abraham. And it was actually in the fullness of time God sent forth his Son so that you have actually a development. Now, this second word, polytropos, divers manners, are diverse manners, that means that he used different ways of communicating. Now, he appeared in dream to Abraham, but he gave Moses the law. And later on, he made certain promises to Joshua, and he spoke through dreams. He spoke through the law. He spoke through the types. He spoke through ritual. He spoke through history. He spoke through poetry. He spoke through prophecy, and he used all these different ones over a long period of time. God brought together about 45 different writers, and he communicated his word over a period of about 1,500 years. So the writer is saying something quite wonderful. And by the way, have you ever stopped to think that that in and of itself makes the Bible a remarkable book? Shakespeare's writings are great on the human plane, but Shakespeare wrote them all. You know, didn't wait for a modern Hollywood writer to write one of the plays. In fact, they wreck them when they get a hold of them. But the important thing is that God used a whole series of human writers, different men with different backgrounds and different competence. One Simon Peter didn't do so well with the Greek language, but I'm not going to criticize him 
I had nine years of it, and you ought to see what I'd do with it. I'd do lots worse than Simon Peter, so I'm going to let him alone on that score. But God used him. But this epistle to the Hebrews, and I believe Paul wrote it, reveals that Paul was a master of it. When he's writing to Galatians and he's writing to Corinthians, he gets right down where the rubber meets the road. He used the language that they used down on the waterfront. And Paul had been down on the waterfront, traveled by boat. So that this is a tremendous verse here. He says here, God, my, this epistle opens on a grand scale. There's nothing before it to try to prove he exists. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoken times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, I hope that I get through this message at least. If you deny the existence of God, may I give you a new thought? The problem may be with you and not with God. So many of these little minds today that have Ph.D. degrees that deny the existence of God, well, May I say to you, my thought is, who are they? And put them down by the side of God. No wonder he didn't waste time proving anything. Because you're going to come to him, you've got to believe that he is. God, who at sundry times, divers manners, diverse manners, he spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Joshua, Moses, David, Isaiah. These are the fathers, but they're not my fathers. May not be your fathers either. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank God he's our God too, but he's the God of the fathers here. And he's talking to some people who could call Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob their father. And he's spoken by the prophets. Now, Moses was a prophet, and he not only spoke of things future, and that, by the way, is not the primary definition of a prophet. A prophet, prophetes, is one who speaks for God. And in the order of speaking for God, he could speak of things that were future. But that actually is secondary as to his office. This, may I say again, is a tremendous verse. Now, God has spoken in the past by the prophets and to the fathers. The Old Testament, very frankly, it wasn't given to the Scotch people in Scotland. That's not where I got it. My ancestors on one side, they came from up there, but that bunch of barbarians and pagans that were there, they never had the Old Testament. It was brought to them later on so that here, we're speaking about a certain people. Now, I hope before we get through with this first verse that we've established that. Friends, it's important to read Scripture aright, to at least let it say what it says, and not make it say something that we want 